Well, hello and welcome to the eighth episode of the SEMA CNBC Management Accounting Series. I'm David Williams. Today, my guests and I aim to demonstrate the applicability of the Global Management Accounting Principles, GMAP, within the practice of financial strategy. And joining me to unpack these principles are Emily Peary, who's Regional Finance and Business Performance Manager at SA Breweries, Vivian Erasmus, Chief Operations Officer at CMA, and Nati Teller, Founder and CEO of the Institute of Management Accounting and Strategy. Good morning to you, panel. Before we get into our uh, details of cost transformation and management, which is really the overall title for the subject for the discussion today let's talk about how we got here and I'll say why we're we doing this to the audience is it's eco mobility week in Santon and we've all been worried because we're right in the heart of Santon of whether I would get here whether you'd get here mm -hmm. but you're all here yeah, and the month continues so uh, we're on the second day now and I thought it would be worthwhile finding out Emily was it okay? SA Breweries just down the road did you get you okay? It was okay for me I gave it a trial run last week already I started using the How Train bus on Wednesday. And I should say yesterday was a little bit chaotic, but today was a breeze. Okay, and yeah. do you, are you allowed to use the How Train bus if you don't use the How Train? Yes, you are. It's 20 runs per day. Just for week, this week, for this, this month? period, yeah. She's done her homework. Vivian? Mm -hmm. We all piled into one car and came through today. So also in the spirit of eco-mobility and not coming each with our own cars today. But at the same time, I have to say, we found it quite easy to get here. We had to take a turnaround going past Friedman Round to back to Stella. Mm -hmm. And that was a bit of a upset, but not too much of one. So there's hope for the month. Well, what's happened yesterday and today is that uh, people seem to think Stella Street is a through road. In fact, it's a dead end. So all the cars are going down thinking that's the way to get to Catherine. And they're all having mm -hmm. to turn around and come back, including a bus which couldn't. <laughs> but these are, these are teething troubles. Nati, how, how did you make it? No, it was very easy for me. I must say, I'm a bit of a party pooper. I didn't join into the whole festival mode. I drove my car oh, you all did. the way oh, here. Yeah, that's terrible, eh? <laughs> because I come, I come from the worst rain, therefore I was not sure how actually I was going to end up in Santin. Um, at some point, I thought of driving to Cresta, leave my car there and jump into the park and ride facility. But I thought, you know what, let me just drive and see what happens. And what happened was you got here on time. So I got here on time, actually I was an hour early, because <laughs> I thought <laughs> I may be affected by the eco-mobility, but thank God I'm here. Okay, so it looks like people are giving it a go and yeah. finding mm -hmm. out ways of doing things. So uh, yesterday a lot of people were cross, but I think it's perhaps gonna it's work out. Yep. Probably, especially if you look at the amount of initiatives the city has taken mm -hmm. to bring in public transport, mm -hmm. having the free shuttles from almost every corner to assist people to get to this destinations in Santon. Well, very positive thoughts there. Okay, that settles us down now for our discussion on cost management accounting. And the topic today is cost transformation and management. And I, I thought before of all the others we've had, this is perhaps goes to the heart of cost management, uh, of, of uh, management accounting, mm -hmm. because in the end, accountants love to deal with costs and find them and take them out of the business. And this is what it's about. So let's start perhaps with each of you from your own experience saying, I mean, obviously, good businesses over many years have cut costs. Mm -hmm. They know mm -hmm. that to do that, you, you, you need to cut costs to make a good business work. But management accounting, the discipline, is saying we can do much more. It's not simply a question of reducing costs. So let's go through the panel and talk about how management accounting recently, in the last few years, whatever the time period, has made a difference to cost management. Um, David, I believe that um, we have the, the capability to make a difference. However, whether we have the space to actually influence the business uh, in terms of cost reduction or cost management, it's another question. Um, I found that we always come up with good ideas, but when it comes to implementation, that's where we are found wanting. You use the word space. Do you, you mean the space in the business? No time? Literally no space in the sense of uh, no people, no room to move in the organization? No, by using space, actually, I'm, I'm referring to having access to the decision makers and being listened to. Mm. You know, it's very important because you, you, you can have a well-crafted document, but if you can't actually present it to the powers that be, then it's going to remain a good document that actually nobody knew about it. I have okay. to agree there. 
I found it very much in South Africa, we still have to battle sometimes the mentality of, I'm going to give you what you need, mm. not what you want. Mm -hmm. And we found it difficult, especially auditing and accounting world, mm. where you have so many bright ideas, and we've all heard about it. Ask the tea lady, and the tea lady is the one with all the answers at the mm. end of the day. Mm. But it comes down to communication with each other and getting to the stakeholders who make the decisions. Because if they don't know about the ideas, the chances of implementation are very low. I can see a theme already emerging here, which we've come across before, and that is it's political, not technical. It's not mm. the accounting. It's, yes. it's a, an internal political thing. Unfortunately, I think with uh, the company that I'm working for, it was not a management accounting idea per se. We came to a place where we realized for us to be competitive, for us to catch up, for us to make a difference in this global economy that we find ourselves operating in, we needed to find a way of cutting costs. So the decisions were already made. We didn't have to push it from a management accounting point of view. Strategically, the decision makers that you find you do not have access to came up with, we promised the market we're going to save so much globally out of SAB Miller. So make it happen. Yes, make it happen. So that's but where they are. If I could just interrupt you there, SAB Miller and my, most companies, but I found SAB in particular, because I worked there for a while, so I do have some experience of it. It was very fierce on costs. Still it's really always cool. been part of the culture. So I'm interested now, you're coming to the, you've been there a couple of years and you're saying the decision was made. In a sense, the decision was always made. But what you're saying is there's always room to there's save There's always more. room. And I think what we did differently this time around was we created an entity called Global Procurement. And what Global Procurement does is consolidate all the purchasing globally. So we have economies of scale and we can cut down costs. We have direct access to our markets. We've got direct access to our vendors, our suppliers. We have one global supplier supplying to the whole of Africa, Europe, LATAM, Asia Pacific. Mm. So we, we are e we, it's easy for us to negotiate costs down. Mm. So yes, there was always a decision to cut costs, but we came up with a brighter way of doing it. Okay, let's mm. come back to this political problem, which is getting the attention of the decision maker. And a question I've asked in a previous SEMA panel is, we need a cost management, uh, a management accountant rather, mm -hmm. in the, the SEMA sense, of uh, quality and experience to be in charge, to understand this. Is this the problem? Do you, are you getting CAs who are used to the normal financial reporting processes and they're not interested in your stuff? Is that the problem? No, I do not think that's the problem. The problem is actually us changing the way things have been happening for a long time, mm. where actually we do not wait for business to dictate to us what needs to happen. But for us to be more proactive and actually approaching business to say, um, we've done some global benchmarks and these are the findings and this is how we believe we need to go about actually reviewing, because it has to start with reviewing, reviewing our cost structure and then coming up then with implementable initiatives that we can actually execute. All right, well, let's, let's go through each of you in turn again, uh, um, Emily and Vivian in a moment, but Nati, seeing you've raised it, you were at Nedbank before you joined the institute, where the, you are the CEO. Yes. It sounds like your institute can be a force for mm -hmm. making people aware of these things. Give me an example from your experience at Nedbank, as you say, where you, you need to review. You need to look at the way the business mm -hmm. is done. Give me an example from the banking world where you identified something. Um, for the seven years I was with the bank, uh, I can recall three uh, instances where global consulting companies were brought in to actually assist the business in terms of uh, cost transformation. And what I found is that some of the suggestions that they've come up with are suggestions that we've always had as the management accounting team, but were never taken as serious as they will be considered if they come from some of these big uh, global Got consulting an example companies. in that world? From th what kind of thing did they identify that you'd already identified? Uh, for an example, one of the things, um, because I supported the IT function at Night Bank, which had a budget of about 3.7 billion. Therefore, we will make recommendations to say it is better actually to convert some of the contractors into permanent because we're finding that from an average salary point of view, we're paying twice as much for, c for contractors than for permanent people. Mm. Therefore, now let's find a mechanism of converting these guys into permanent employees. And what I found is that when then the global consulting houses, they come through, they make the same mm. recommendations. But because it comes from those guys, then that decision then to implement what we've been advocating for such a long time, then it gets accelerated and, and implemented. Did you point this out to the authorities? 
um, you've got to be politically savvy when you're in this <laughs> corporate. You, know? you can't just say, I, 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 I said it before. But I told you. I told you. So, yeah, I told <laughs> you. so there's politics in, involved. A exactly. But in <coughs> order to, we've, we've got to um, embrace the fact that there's corporate politics and we've got to find ways of maneuvering around that politics. Because at the end of the day, the person that you're supposed to say, I told you so, is the guy who's going to determine your, your bonus and your salary. <laughs> if we wouldn't want to step on their toes. Sounds very sad, but <laughs> true. Vivian, from your experience, give me an example of uh, following on from what Marty said. Of Marty's course, uh, in the accounting and auditing industry, we do often see it with our clients, having to make those decisions. In some cases where our clients already has management accountants on board, mm. you can see sometimes the management accountants struggling to get through to push, push their d ideas a bit through to the rest of the panel. Whereas in some, you found that the management accountants are the ones being listened to. Mm -hmm. Of course, as a COO also, People would think someone in a basically administrative per position should not be an accountant, whereas we always say the one in the, that specific position needs to be able to step into the shoes of anyone around to ensure that the operations run smoothly. So we've seen financial accountants in the positions where I'm sitting, as well as in positions with our clients where they make the decisions but still sometimes also struggling with those office politics, deciding how do I now nicely tell him mm -hmm. that he's wrong, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Because mostly it comes down to most of the typical accountants out there hates being told they're wrong mm. because they're working with figures and the figures don't lie. Mm. Can you think again of an example where this was the case? Uh, an example would be one of our clients had a situation they are in the motor industry and the one guy told him, listen, can we please look at reintroducing our or re-looking at making a maintenance team as well? No, 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 not right now. Mm. Uh, also, a couple of months down the line, auditors come, have you looked at outsourcing? Mm. And suddenly that came in, mm. just because someone with a bit more authority mm. in that situation came in to say, this is the way forward. In this case, the auditor came in and asked, mm. and also from outside. Again, it's that outside authority, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Emily, SAB, you came to there f uh, a couple of years ago. It's a long, proud history that the company has. So did you run up against uh, some walls when you wanted to change things? Um, be careful what you say. <laughs> I, should be, I should be extremely careful what I say here. <laughs> I think SAB is notorious for having a lot of people with good ideas. So you, you have a boardroom full of people that have got brilliant ideas and you don't really know which one is going to end up winning at the end of the day. We proud ourselves for having very good debates. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and what I think I would shy away from putting it the way my colleagues have put mm. it, that you come up with an idea and it's not <coughs> embraced and it's not seen through. I think the forums that we have in SAB that have been created and they there's an environment that encourages good debate. Out of that, we come up with decisions. You don't even know who came up with it, whose decision it was, but it's the implementation process that actually is, takes up the, uh, the, that, um, takes up the bigger chunk of mm. how we got to that decision. I, for one, ended up project managing um, a centralization of the back office finance. Not so much that I, because I was a management accountant and I didn't even have project management skills, but because I saw where our inefficiencies lay and I was very passionate about it. Mm. So I ended up being asked for a year to, I gave up what I was doing and for a year I managed, I project managed the, uh, the outsourcing of some of the back end finance accounting roles to India and got consolidated because we had duplication. We had a lot of the same roles mm. in almost every branch, every region. SAB mm. has got enjoyed autonomy, so every brewery was an entity in its own right. So on the one hand, it's good to decentralize authority. On the other hand, you have duplication of systems and procedures. Exactly. So mm. we had to establish what, what is this really costing us? Do we need to duplicate resources? Can we bring everybody into the center at central office in Santon? And that worked out perfectly well. Yes, there were teething problems initially, and you, you can never anticipate what you do not know unless you do it. Of course, they're very sensitive at SAB about uh, decentralization and devolving authority. Hence, central office, not head office. Yes, central head office. office implies that's where all the power is. And they called it central office to say, no, we're just the central, central office. office. The power is actually out there, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So it all seems to come back to, and one of the points in the SEMA document, it talks about 
You've got to challenge the business model that you're operating with. And Vivian, I think a lot of companies are in love with their history, especially if they're good companies. This is the way we do things here. This is what works. And it sounds to me like the management accountants are having often to challenge that. Definitely, definitely. Unfortunately, that is part of our history in South Africa as well, where you're so used to doing things a certain way. And in some cases, to introduce change is always saying to someone, but that your way is not right. Mm. And I found that, unfortunately, most of the times you do battle some egos out there when you try to tell them there's a different way. Of course, at that moment in time, all that person hears is, my way is wrong, mm. which immediately raises hackles and causes mm. conflict. But in some cases, like with SA Breweries centralizing some functions, we found it as well. If we centralize some of the functions, you cut down on costs and suddenly productivity increases and you've got more time, more resources available to spread around to the other teams. Now, Nati, you're at the Institute of Management Accounting and Strategy. I mean, this puts you at the heart of the thought leadership mm -hmm. role for this industry. So it's not, you were at Nedbank dealing with Nedbank resisting or not resisting change, trying to bring things in. Now you're in a position where you can actually look at the profession as a whole. Mm -hmm. It sounds like your interventions are as much political, psychological as technical. No, that's very true. Um, where we start, actually, um, we, we start with the SEMA curriculum. Um, I'm, I'm sure in your previous engagement, um, you've touched on the fact that SEMA had to review its curriculum. For now, the new curriculum has actually taken into account uh, what is happening out there. The for now, we are helping in terms of training the people that will be corporate savvy that will have all the technical skills in order to engage uh, the different stakeholders that exist within their organizations. Therefore, we are focused mainly on the uh, technical side, but then helping people as well to, to develop uh, people's skills that will allow them to maneuver mm. um, in the midst of the corporate politics that we mentioned earlier. Mm. That's where we are currently focusing. But there's something that I want to also mention, David, um, which was was mentioned by my colleagues here, is that what I have actually observed is that many organizations only go through rigorous cost uh, reduction as a reactive yes. measure. Mm -hmm. It's never done actually as a proactive um, And usually when, when hard times come. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Definitely. exactly. And uh, a, a story that is quite um, familiar to all of us here I is the story of the uh, global uh, steel industry where mm -hmm. actually um, the steel that is imported from China is 25% less than what actually it's costing South African companies to produce. And therefore now these guys, because they're facing uh, this dumping of mm. Chinese steel in the local market, now they, they're saying, let's wait and see. What can we do to counteract mm -hmm. the dumping of steel? Mm -hmm. But they're going to go and come up with rigorous and um, very drastic measures to try and address the cost element. But the question is this, why were you waiting mm. Mm. all this time? Mm. You understand? Therefore, I'm, I'm just trying to... to, to so to what you're talking about is inculcating an attitude, mm -hmm. exactly, uh, which is saying, don't wait for the bad times, mm -hmm. you can exactly. save costs now. Exactly. So lots of nodding, uh, <laughs> Emily, while he was uh, saying that. Yeah, and I think um, as much as we say that we wait for the hard times to come up with cost-saving measures. I think, like you rightly said, SAB has always been doing that, whether before the recession, mm -hmm. after the recession, something that has been at the core of SAB. And we've always believed that it's a way for us to be competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's public knowledge at the moment that we, there's, there's an offer on the table for SAB by AB mm -hmm. in Dev. And we always have to be ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. How do we sustain that? Um, we, when I talked about SAB coming up with procurement to ensure that we, we get this global procurement purchasing system in place, was to ensure that we're competitive. Mm. So we have um, a lot of Chinese goods that are coming into South Africa, into the rest of Africa, into, into the globe for that matter. Do we purchase from China? Do we purchase locally? Mm. Now there's always that with the uh, triple BEE in South Africa mm. where you have mm. this preferential procurement. How do you make those decisions? Mm. And that's something, apart from looking at the cost cutting element that every company in South Africa has to look at, you have to look at the balance, the, the, the juggling that has to happen from a Department of Trade and Industry point of view and what is good for the business. Mm. And um, yes, there are a lot of 
companies that you might say wait for them to cut costs when the time is right. But I think SA, I can speak for SAB in saying that mm. they've constantly been doing that. It's great, great actually yeah. to, to, to note that, uh, David. Uh, but one advantage that SAB has is the economies of scale because they're, they're the second largest brewery. But you find that some of these organizations that I was referring to earlier on, they're not uh, in the same uh, scale as SAB. Therefore, they do not have mm. uh, that advantage. But I do note the point that uh, my colleague has actually made. Mm. And I have to agree with the point of corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's something that has become all the more known in South Africa in the last couple of years. And suddenly you have to not only save costs, but at the same time you have to show that you're taking the initiative mm -hmm. in corporate social responsibility <coughs> in procuring from mm -hmm. South African members. I've got here a, a case study of British Telecom their equivalent of telcom, I suppose, <coughs> which is listed like uh, our, our telcom is. And they go through, they talk about having transformed their cost base in six years. They saved 5.5 billion pounds by taking a management accounting approach and they halved the size of their finance team. So it wasn't like they were adding costs uh, while they were cutting costs. But there are a couple of other interesting things in there that I want to talk about, but let's talk about the cost drivers. I mean, the first thing you've got to do is identify where the costs mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they did was they said, when identifying the costs, don't say we want a percentage saving. Mm -hmm. Because all the business will mm -hmm. do is say, well, let's find that mm -hmm. percent. Mm -hmm. And once they found it, they say, we've done it. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. question to be asked is, what is the value of what we're doing? Can you save more? Not, mm -hmm. you must save 10%. Mm -hmm. Could you save 20? Mm -hmm. So, tell me about identifying those cost drivers? I think I'll go first because I'm passionate about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in the procurement space, what we've been doing is, and I talk a lot about procurement because that's what I'm currently <laughs> doing. That's <laughs> what we want. Um, we, what SAB did was go to all our suppliers and with the, are we busy in the budgeting phase of SAB Limited? And procurement gives pricing for all our commodities. So malt and barley, maize, adjuncts, sugar, everything that's involved in the making of beer and soft drinks. It was not good enough for us to just go out there and procure, negotiate contracts that are good enough. We went into the spaces of our suppliers and said, fine, when you charge us this particular cost, what drives it? Yeah. How much of that is labor? How much of that is your inefficiency that you're passing on to us? So we actually uh, partnered with our suppliers. We, for example, um, down-gauged our cartons. We made them smaller. We light-weighted bottles. All of that, they were, they were ending up spending a lot less and they were passing those savings across to us. So we had to ad understand what the cost drivers for each and every price that we're given. SAB goes back to the supply and says, fine, give us a breakdown of this cost. How much of this is uh, overheads that you can easily do away with? How much of this, we walk around their plants, look at the inefficiencies that are going on and we point them out, say we will help you clean that up as long as you pass that on to us. Okay, and that's an... Uh, uh, an accountant doing this, not mm. uh, a packaging person. A That's packaging. the point, isn't it? <coughs> that the management accountant can creatively help the operational definitely. side. Definitely. I have to say, definitely, especially when you look at inefficiencies and efficiencies, if we first cut down on labour costs, that saves quite a number of amounts if you cut down labour to a point where you know that the people around you are really productive. One of the measures in a service company, for example, would be that each of your employees, especially in something like accounting and auditing, that those employees write at least three times their monthly salary as fees, which is an easy way to say, yes, now I can see you're effective. Of course, using time management tools also helps. Things like manic time where you literally track how long you're spending on what mm. and then see where you can, maybe those hours spent on the emails are a bit mm, mm. something we need to look at. And know. the social media, which is another uh. issue. I'd like the, the management accountants to get into the social media and what time it wastes. Yes, um, going back then to the question you were asking earlier, uh, identifying cost driver is, is key because um, the cost that we'll have as an organisation will become a function of the cost driver 
and mm -hmm. the, the cost per unit. Therefore, mm -hmm. you take like your, your volume multiplied by your, by your cost per unit. It's very mm -hmm. important then that you do that. And how we as accountants can actually assist organizations, it's how we structure our management accounts on a monthly basis. We've got to structure them in a way that they can actually engage the stakeholders that receives those management accountants. I can give you a simple example that um, at NetBank where I headed up costing and transfer pricing, what we used to do uh, before I got there is that we'll, we'll prepare then our income statement in terms of about six categories, staff costs, computer costs, telecommunication and travel, and other sundry. Therefore, somebody then will get the report, will say, okay, against the budget, we either down or we, we are right. like on track, mm. right? But then it says nothing about the, the cost drivers. For now, what you will want to do is to say, okay, I have staff cost. It's 5% below our budget, we, which means a positive variance. But let me actually further break down this staff cost into the number of people that we have. Mm -hmm. How many people do we have? How many are permanent? How many are contractors? What's the average salary per each category? So that you can have a better hang in terms of a better handle in terms of what is driving the staff cost. Mm. Because what tends to happen in many organizations is that if David resigns, the next day when he walks out of the office, you want to replace. But we never actually have a discussion that says, do we really want to replace David? Mm. Do we really need to? Well, the other part of that discussion mm. is we don't need him before he resigns. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what retrenchment is about, I suppose. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. But then now what I'm trying to push for, I it's a culture where we're more proactive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But mm -hmm. also as management accountants, try to move away from the traditional way of actually reporting. Mm. Report in a manner that will actually add value to the organisations. And isn't this the key? It's the communication of these concepts exactly. that gets the attention of the business. That's exactly. The Definitely. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk. Always key. Yeah, we're going to talk in a moment about communication mm -hmm. to the business and with uh, the management accounting function, and the people, uh, the costs of people, and outsourcing and doing it yourself. But we're going to take a short break before we do that. When we come back, we will continue the discussion and we're going to take some questions and comments from our studio audience. Don't go away. Welcome back. And with me are Emily Perry, who is Regional Finance and Business Performance Manager at SAB, Vivian Erasmus, Chief Operations Officer at CMA, and Nati Teller, Founder and Chief Executive at the Institute of Management Accounting and Strategy. So let's talk now about communication, where we left off uh, just before the break. Uh, and talking of these targets, so it's the targets and it's the communication. Identifying the cost drivers, now we're going to try and identify a target. The point about that is you have to identify and formulate a target which the business takes seriously. It's no use imposing a target, people say, oh, please, we can't do that, and nothing happens. I have to say that's very true. If you don't implement or strategize properly, especially when you don't involve your team, I think that's also key to implementing and properly strategizing and developing a plan, is to talk to your team and find out what is what is possible to save on. It's no use going to your team and say, okay, I've formulated this plan, let's, let's make it work. Because yes, you might get away with it 80% of the time, but you're going to end up with <coughs> people resilient to this change. So many of the formulation goes around asking, talking, discussing and saying, this is what we need to do, this is why we need to do it. Especially with things like retrenchments coming in, where you have people already thinking, maybe I'm going to lose my job. Maybe we need to figure out how to work around this. And then suddenly you get all these bright ideas coming in and you're wondering, why haven't I done this sooner? Emily? SAB is big on ensuring that the targets are well known because we get what we call short-term incentives <coughs> on a yearly basis and they're target driven. Mm. So from the get-go, when targets are set at the top and they cas they're cascaded down to the different functions, different departments, different regions, you get to a place where everybody in the organization knows what it is they're supposed to be working towards. And on a regular basis, for example, in procurement, every quarter we look at what, how we're doing against the targets that were set. And if they're not going according to plan, what can we do to ensure that we get to the numbers that have been uh, set for us? 
Um, with what works for SAB is the fact that we've got targets that are joint co-owned. So you've got a department like procurement that has got supply chain and manufacturing mm. targets that we cannot deliver on our own. For example, if we came up with, we're going to save so much by downgrading or da by uh, light scaling a water bottle. Procurement is not technical. Mm. We can negotiate a contract. Mm. The technical aspect has to go and make sure that that's done. And we have to agree from the get-go how we save, the, how we share that mm. savings. That's Whereas I think the old model would be the technical guys say, this is what we're going to do. And then do it. Go afterwards the accountants say, oh, okay, how much is it going to cost? Yeah. And that's the cost. That's, mm. that's how yeah. it used to be. Mm. No, that's true. Um, it's very important that actually um, we adopt the right approach in terms of communicating. So uh, what tips have you got for organisations? We At the beginning of the discussion, we heard some frustration. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, we, we know what to do. We, it's hard to get the attention of the business. We haven't the credibility, we haven't the political clout mm. in the business. What advice have you got for people in that position? Because you're in that position now where you're seeing what's happening in business. Yes. Um, it starts by actually educating or communicating to your direct report, if for an example I'm the CEO, you've got to look at the, ma the impact of the macroeconomic environment and, and actually how it's impacting the business. Because if you can start by sharing the macroeconomic environment, you're saying we are currently in a very volatile uh, business environment and therefore this requires us to change the way we're doing things. And then you, you bring it closer to home. You're saying well, this is what's currently happening in South Africa from an economic environment. This is how our potential customers are affected mm. by the tough economic environment. Therefore, now you bring it closer and closer, but using something that people can easily relate to. Mm -hmm. And then once then they, 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 they've bought into the story, then now you're saying, we need to look at ourselves and come up with initiatives that can save us 100 million, 200 million. Mm. But where did you start? You started at the global picture, okay, which is something picture. that people fully understand. I have to say, I agree with him there. Comparison. Mm. You have to compare yourself to the benchmark. Getting mm. that information might be difficult, especially in your small to medium enterprises, mm. but in your larger enterprises, that's easy to come by. Many of the JSEs, but enlisted entities have yeah. published financial statements mm. where you can say, this is the benchmark I'm looking towards. I was going to say, are the financial statements enough of uh, a benchmark for you when you're really doing this properly. Companies like to keep the information mm. to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, SAB, you know, it's very proud, a lot of proprietorial information, mm -hmm. you don't share it. Instinctively, uh, they don't want to tell other mm. people what they're doing, even if it's not top secret. Mm. Yes, So I, I just want to, to say, the financial statements by themselves are not adequate. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. However, um, in my time at NetBank, actually, we engage with the corporate executive board which is a global organization that does um, a number of research. And therefore, one of the research or benchmark exercise that they do, it's looking at uh, budgets of different organizations. Then by participating in such a benchmarking exercise, then now allows you to compare yourself, number one, with uh, global organizations that have this, a similar revenue uh, mm -hmm. as yourself, mm -hmm. that may not necessarily be in the same industry as you but also because a number of organizations participate in, in, in that benchmarking exercise, then they have the ability to actually compare your results with companies that are similar mm. to yourself. But isn't the danger here that you, it's anti-competitive, so... They won't disclose actually the name. Yes. Ah. Then they'll say uh, peer companies without actually listing the names of those okay. companies. Mm. In some cases, of course, you also got the global rankings. IAB mm -hmm. is mm. probably the most well-known accounting and auditing ranking firm. Mm. And they work on this very set-specific staff, turnover, mm. and amount of offices. Mm -hmm. So you immediately can see, listen, we're at this level, whereas one of the bigger four is at that level. Mm. Or, but this is what they're looking at. This mm. is the amount of offices they've got. Well, I suppose SAB, like a big banking organization, you've got a global best practice now to work by. Mm. We do. You say that uh, <laughs> really <hesitantly>. regretfully. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we do. I think when we we've been intros uh, we've been introspective in a lot of ways previously, and I think we get into a place where we're beginning to compare ourselves to the best out there. Mm. We are not the best. We can. There's always room for improvement, and there are organisations that we can emulate, and we're busy doing that. 
for example, integrated uh, supply chain that we, the road that we've embarked on, we were not the initiators, we're mm -hmm. not the pioneers. Other companies are doing a better job than we're doing and we are obviously trying to learn from them. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I know that Mondelez has got a, what they call a closed loop uh, value realization where they measure the costs, how the costs filter back into the income statement, etc. SAB has not implemented that yet and we know that it's working for somebody else and why are we not doing it? So we're always looking for ways to improve ourselves. But to analyse is, I think, always the best way of seeing where the differences can be made is exactly that, to analyse with others and to constantly challenge your business plan, mm. constantly challenge where you can change, where you can go better, where you can work more effectively. Do you celebrate when you've achieved something? And I often think of the sales departments of big companies. I've talked at conferences sometimes and it's rah-rah stuff and they've met their targets and they get rewarded. <laughs> This is the salespeople. Mm. I don't know if the accounting department uh, has a rah-rah <laughs> occasion. <laughs> Guys, we, we always, we always celebrate that when we meet that deadline, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> but a deadline is just what you're supposed to do. Exactly. It shouldn't be a celebration. Exactly. That's what Unless your job is. Unless you are at that financial year end. <laughs> yeah. But you raise a valid point. But what yes. about the celebration? I mean, if the business is to take you seriously and you're to take the business seriously, you need to celebrate success, don't you? Definitely. Not definitely. Most especially when you know that you've come up with those initiatives mm. and you've seen actually them being taken serious you know you will celebrate however uh, as mentioned earlier is that um, our role as uh, the finance team tends to be the one that polices people around yes. you mm. know we're always chasing people um, and, and, and trying to make sure that people can stick to the budget yeah that's what we do well but that as well <laughs> requires a change in <laughs> mindset in a sense that I'll give you a typical example a junior accountant will say to the business person when they come with an invoice, this invoice was not budgeted for. Oh. But a this junior not accountant authorized. who's not, uh, I will say, and then I'll explain, <laughs> who's not CMAD, which means who's not uh, well versed <laughs> with what CIMA is trying to inculcate in management accountants, right, will say, there's no budget, go away. But a clever management accountant will say, do we really need to spend this? What is the impact if we do not spend this much mm -hmm. money? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we may be forced to spend in, re in responding to a change in the competitive mm -hmm. landscape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we may not have forecasted this in our budget, but now it's a business imperative that we actually mm -hmm. spend so much money mm -hmm. to counter maybe an entrance of a new player in mm -hmm. our local market. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's what then a, a management accountant who's simmered you know, who fully <laughs> understand. <laughs> like you know that. what I mean? I think this I is like a, like a new verb, isn't <laughs> it? Yeah, definitely. You seem it. Have you used it before? Have you just no, this is the first it? time. Seem it. <laughs> yeah. Register that word yes, uh, as <laughs> copyrighted by this panel. <laughs> Are you seamed yet? Exactly, yeah. you know what I mean. Is your chief executive seamed? <laughs> <laughs> Does he understand? Because um, uh, what SEMA is trying to, to do is that technically you can be good, but you need to have uh, the business acumen skill, yep. mm -hmm. which means you need mm -hmm to think like their CEO. And you get respect if you talk like that because then they start saying, well, mm. this person really is thinking mm. about exactly. the business. Exactly. Yes. And of All course, right. one of our first questions are, did you read the Global Management Accounting Principles? Yes. <laughs> because if you look at the Global Management Accounting Principles, it really is a very good guideline document. Mm. It tells you exactly what mm. you need to think about when mm. you're in that specific area. Mm. Don't you find that? Yes. yes. I, as a non-accountant of, of whatever kind, I do find it accessible too. So it's mm. not like the business can't understand what you're mm. asking. No, definitely. No, understand. they've put it very nicely. Let's uh, take uh, uh, comment questions from the floor. They've promised that they're going to do this. So now we're going to go to the floor and we're going to bring a microphone to you. Who can I have first? Yes, if you could just uh, identify yourself, please, sir, and uh, where you're from. Yeah, my name is Fabian Cáceres. I'm the head of finance from Philips in South Africa. I'm from Mexico. So my question to the panel is that in emerging markets like South Africa and Africa that has, we have a double digit growth and we have a lot of ambition, how do you communicate to the organization the difference between cost management and investment for growth? How do you communicate to the business the difference between cost management and investment, investing for growth? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so cost management, I see that as a short term kind of uh, um, view. So we're managing the cost because Investment for growth is looking at uh, for, uh, what he's talked about being CMED. If we invest this now, I know it's going to cost us a lot, 
in the short run, but what are we getting out of it? Why are we going to have to invest so much? What is mm -hmm. in it for us in the long term? And we have to always have those two different time frames because cost management, management will be, this is what we're looking at in this time period. Investing for growth is what is this going to bring into our space over a longer period of time? Mm. Mm -hmm. Trying to find that balance between short and long term actually does give rise to a conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, we're always trying to impress with our current uh, uh, numbers. We want to have that 15% growth in your headline earnings at the expense of actually investing for growth. Mm -hmm. Therefore, now we need to have a culture change where we're saying we fully understand that we may be under pressure at this point in time. However, we need to think long term. And once you have that culture change, you will then start actually doing the right things because they will actually give us sustainable long-term results. You want to add to that, Vivian? I have to say I agree with my colleagues over here. Mm. It's mostly that balance, mm. keeping that balance all the while, mm. be between investing and your corporate social responsibility versus what can I save? Mm. How can I maximize my profit? Mm. Mm. And once we get that balance right in our organizations, that's when you really see a company geared for change, a company like SAB Miller, where this has been happening for mm. years already. And it sounds, if you're not taking that management accounting approach, you're less likely to get the balance right because Very there's true. a gap then in the way the business is being managed. Especially if they look at it mostly on a historical basis mm. where we bring in your accountants and auditors and we always look at what happened in the past. Not just because we like being retrospective, but because we can see the differences. We can see, analyze the changes and tell you, but mm. this doesn't look right. And also the past is very seductive because you have a graph, mm -hmm. which is a mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. which the future doesn't have a graph, very so you gray. like, like very to live gray. in the past. But that's where Other return, return on investment comes in. Sorry, just yeah, to, carry to on. Mm. tie this up. Um, if you're looking at investing, and this is, I'm notorious for asking this question. Okay, we, we need to spend this, yes. It's a lot of money, yes. Um, are we going to get anything back? Uh, no, how are we going really to know we've got it? In the marketing department, at, I like marketing people. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they very friendly? <laughs> but it's like you always spend in the marketing space and the question I constantly ask is, what, how are we going to measure that we've gotten our back, uh, value for the, every run that we're spending? So we come up with, I mean, Sima has been very good in ensuring that we know how to calculate return on every, every investment. So we're investing. It's long term, but are we going to get a return on that? And that's what I would emphasize on. Get me a, mo a, a, a model that shows me that what we're investing in now is worth investing in because we're going to get the return. I would imagine if you're from Philips, there was a big discussion at some point with the green mm. imperative and lower wattage light bulbs. Yeah. Uh, how much do we invest in the low mm. watt bulbs? Will people accept them? Mm. I mean, there's a whole interesting debate there just about light bulbs. Definitely. Other questions, comments? Yes, over there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nishek Ndoro. I'm finance manager at Fitz University. Um, the management accounting techniques that we are using today, I mean, th they were developed in the 1950s and in the 1920s, 50s, 1850s. So the question is, uh, Cost, uh, the cost transformation, is it uh, keeping pace with the global developments? I mean, uh, companies go going I mean, to other countries to operate, so is it keeping a uh, pace? Uh? I have to say the new methodologies we bring in, especially the methodologies brought in by SEMA with the global management accounting principles, does really, they've spent a lot of time in developing this document specifically, and it does bring into it that you will see if you read through the global management accounting principles, suddenly we're covering a lot more ground than was covered even 45 years ago. Suddenly we're saying, think about more. Look at integrated reporting, which came in only a few years ago, which is something that suddenly we're not reporting less, we're reporting a lot more. So we're keeping up with what's globally currently handling out there. Yes, over there. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Alex. I'm from Certified Master Auditors. Um, my question revolves around the balancing of uh, cost saving and employment. Looking at um, our situation that we are a third world country and um, right now we have got unions uh, in the mining sector, for example. 
where commodity prices are coming down, but they are still pushing for higher wages yeah. and threats for retrenchment at the same time. How do you then bring in the cost transformation to uh, give value to well, the companies? Again, it's that balance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, Emily, I know SAB, uh, you know, they believe in their people. On the other hand, when they save costs, sometimes they have to lose their people. It's this paradox, people. isn't it? It is. Uh, I don't think there's one clear-cut answer to say this is how we're going to manage it, otherwise the strikes in South Africa would be history. Um, it's something that we're still trying to wrap our heads around, where do you strike the balance? And everybody knows that with the, with the economy not uh, performing at the rate, uh, growing at the rate we'd like it to grow, there uh, um, inevitably will be job losses in the country. What we need, I think, what it comes back to the aspect of communication. And I know that you can communicate all you want to the union members as to whether they understand what it is that you're trying to communicate or not is a completely different story. But I think I would, I believe that from uh, at the source of everything, communication is key. And if we got all the, all the different parties that are trying to uh, establish ways of growing the economy, establish ways of retaining those jobs and not having to retrain so many people, and having the union understand that they cannot get the kind of demands, they cannot have their demands made. And from a management, from a senior management point of view, I think it's, tr it's having to get to a place where you show that you're empath you've got empathy for the union members that you're, um, dealing. you're dealing with. Uh, it's yeah, a lot of it is, they don't know where we're coming from. They yes. don't understand yes. us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you can still disagree, but if you understand, yes. it's, it's better. Yes, um, in this um, tough economic environment, having a, a low cost base obviously can give you a competitive advantage. Yeah. You know. However, what we need to understand as well in South Africa, uh, I fully understand what um, my brother is asking over there, but uh, I found lots of organizations are just too lazy to think outside the accounting box. You know, they always say accountants can't think outside the box. But I found <laughs> lots of organizations who are headed up either by engineers or by other people. Ooh. They're lazy to think. <laughs> and the reason why I'm saying that, it's always easy to look for, for retrenchment as the first option mm -hmm. to cut costs. Mm -hmm. um, during the financial crisis, NetBank was the only bank in South Africa that did not retrench. And mm -hmm. we know that some of our peers actually retrenched. How did you manage that? It's because we, we communicated, number one, what was happening globally mm. and what was happening in South Africa. And then we said, where else can we actually find cost savings? Mm. And number two, we said to people, let's push productivity. Mm. Because one of the uh, biggest challenges facing the mining industry, it's not an issue of overcapacity. It's an issue of low productivity. Mm. Therefore, mm. if you can communicate to all your stakeholders mm. to say, we are currently facing a squeeze of in our margins as a result of the low uh, gold or platinum price. But as an organization, we're taking a conscious decision not to retrench. However, we are looking to you, um, labor partners, mm. to actually increase productivity. And by so doing, then we'll be pushing volumes in terms of uh, what we are selling out there. And then our revenue will grow, though the gold price is low. It's all about finding a right balance. Let's mm. not go for, I know they call it um, uh, low-hanging fruit. Mm. There are many low-hanging fruit uh, discretionary spending. Reduce your discretionary spending. Relook at your IT cost and find ways of tightening up the belt when it comes to mm. IT cost. There are many areas where we can look. And all of this, you're saying, mm. can come from the management accounting function mm. because that's its job, in a sense, is to look a for A proactive those. management proactive. accountant Seamed. who is CIMAD. <laughs> CIMAD. Exactly. Got to be CIMAD, right? Exactly. <laughs> Okay. That ties in very nicely with the telecoms mm. case study you mentioned <coughs> earlier. Because suddenly, if you start looking at where is my cost really lying? Can, is it really worthwhile outsourcing something well, or bringing it back? I'd, sorry to interrupt, Vivian, but we are running out of time. But I do want to mention that British Telecom example. And I remember the rage for outsourcing and companies would talk about core competence. This is our core competence. Everything else we must outsource, catering, IT, mm. whatever. British Telecom, they found that they needed to move away from outsourcing. They put all their financial services back in-house and they were spending, they found before they did this, 400 million pounds a year mm. on consultants. Mm -hmm. And mm. you mentioned earlier, you know, mm. the consultants mm. can be much mm. more expensive. So mm. it's a false economy. Mm. Have you found this? Yes, I just want to quickly chip in here. Um, 
a few, I think two years ago, uh, when Miss Lindy Sisulu was the minister of, um, I've forgotten the department, but defense, <laughs> wasn't it? before defense, yeah. actually, uh, she, uh, public service, mm. she said the government spends 70 billion on consultants. Mm. If there's one area where the government can right? actually cut it's consulting fees. Well, it assumes that the government people themselves can do One the job. Step. That's another problem. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's then by coming but to organizations to like SEMA <laughs> and say, can we have management accountants? Yeah. And uh, at some point, I remember that, that the Treasury Department was looking at introducing a SEMA training program mm -hmm. where they can bring in people who are SEMA. Mm -hmm. yeah. You understand? <laughs> if they can do that, they can save us yeah. lots of money. We've yeah. seen a story, uh, I think, uh, last week, Monday, in the newspaper that the government spent for microwave, I think, 10,000 rents. <laughs> Therefore, we need to help our government because <laughs> the <laughs> revenue collection is very yeah. low at this point in time. They need to be seamed. Government they need to be seamed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Emily? Um, I think there, there are pros and cons to outsourcing and insourcing. And whereas it worked for British uh, Telecom, yeah. Telecom, SAB has to an extent gone the other way. We've outsourced a lot of what can be done from anywhere. So it's in, 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 in our push to save costs, we've actually outsourced the back office finance accounting. Isn't processing. the danger then that you don't have control over oh, what I'll they do? I'll get to that, yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you, which one is the lesser yeah, evil? <laughs> <laughs> you have to establish which one, is, which one can you live with, okay? Yes. Is it the reduced cost or is it the fact that you don't have control and there's a lot of, there a lot of SLAs that you get to manage. So you spend more time managing SLAs than doing the, than doing the job yourself if it is in-house. Mm. So I cannot put my head on the block and say I'm pro or against outsourcing. I think it's got its merits. Depending okay. on it depends um, on each and every company. I, I think. have to guillotine this conversation. <laughs> I'm glad I have to because it means there's a lot more to talk about, but mm -hmm. we, can't, uh, you know, we can't do it now. We'll return to some of these issues doubtless later. And unfortunately, that brings us to the end of this edition, the 8th of the SEMA CNBC Management Accounting Series. It's been a great discussion. Uh, thanks to our panel and thanks to our studio audience. Uh, my guests, of course, were Emily Perry, Emily Perry, who is uh, Regional Finance and Business Performance Manager at SAB, Vivian Erasmus, uh, Chief Operations Officer at CMA, and Nati Teller, Founder and CEO at the Institute of Management Accounting and Strategy. And thanks to you for watching, and remember to SEMA yourself as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> That was a very nice...